Well, I welcome you to Capital Life Church. We are on the verge of a national election, and I want to encourage each and every one of you to vote. I know it may be a sacrifice to get out into the lines, and perhaps you've already voted, but it's so important that we recognize our role as the church, that we are a remnant people and that we take a stand. So I encourage you to take a stand, but do so prayerfully. And this nation is at a crossroads and we are believing for God to move and to move mightily. I encourage you again, consider yourself as a remnant people, the people of God. Our world is changing, there's no doubt about it. I can see it uh, ever since the turn of the century. There have been great changes, and I've talked recently about technological changes, but we also have had a change in viewpoint and worldview that we have seen over the last <clears throat> couple of decades and certainly over the last few years. What are the values of our nation? And I would further say, is the church promoting God's priorities, God's ways? Well, we are the church. It's not a building. And so today I want to speak on the subject, uncompromised in a compromised world. The Bible speaks that we should be salt and light. And you've heard me say that a number of times over the last few months. I really believe God is speaking a word to our hearts that we are to be salt, which is a preservative. It is a preserving agent. It keeps meat from being uh, going decayed. And then we also see the terminology of light, that light dispels darkness. So we are to be a preserving agent in our generation. When everything goes directions other than God, we being the remnant people preserve the ways of God. And when everything goes dark and darker, we are the light. We dispel the darkness wherever we go. Not that we're so great, but the Spirit of God within us as we carry the gospel, as we carry the Word of God wherever we go. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said these words, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And I think that's a great, great quote. There are two worldviews. I want you to think about that. There are two worldviews that we can embrace. And whether you realize it, the people around you that you rub shoulders with have embraced one of these two worldviews. So have you. What are those worldviews? Number one, Christian theism. That God and his word are the final authority. Now this is where we should stand. That God and his word are the final authority. You'll have a lot of voices out there, a lot of opinions, but we always take everything back to the Word of God. We measure it against the Word of God. Christian theism. The second is secular humanism. That means that man and his reason uh, reign supreme. So if I believe it, then it is. I don't recognize God as being the final authority. Uh, my reason is the final authority. And we see these two worldviews clashing and combating. And we need to recognize that they're out there, that secular uh, humanism is very much rampant around the globe and in our school systems. And we have professors that are constantly pumping out uh, this uh, secular humanism uh, in the classroom. And so we wonder why it is that our nation keeps going directions that we're saying, you've got to be kidding. You can't go that direction. You need to do things in a way that honors your creator. You need to do things in regard to this creator that we speak uh, about, uh, who uh, is the one that knows us better than we know ourselves. And he created the world and he created the universe. And he has the final word. Daniel in the scriptures is one of my favorites. Daniel, his name actually means uh, God is my judge. And when I think about that, I want you to think about that for just a moment. His name means God is my judge. I, 
I tend, when I, when I consider the meaning of his name, I tend to think, did he recognize fully the impact of what that meant to him? Did that resonate in some way? way? Was there a, an awareness of the heart that God was always watching in his lifetime? And that God would be the final judge, no matter what anybody tried to do or convince him of, that God was watching and he wanted to please God. I wonder how much that awareness was in his heart and in his mind. Uh, I think it would be a good awareness for each and every one of us. He'll have a name change at a certain point. I'll talk about that in a moment. But his name means God is my judge. And the angels, the Bible tells us that the angels describe him as a man greatly beloved. So I want to look in the word of God with you to the book of Daniel and starting in the first chapter and with the very first verse. The Bible says in the, thir in the third year of the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, <clears throat> let me see if I can say this all right, uh, Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered the king of Judah into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he's, he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put it in the treasure house of his God, little g, God. Then the king ordered uh, Ashpenaz, I like that name. Sounds like he has panache. Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So in other words, they're going to take the very elite the very best, and they're going to place them into captivity. He was to teach them the language and literature of, not of God, of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, uh, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. Now remember, I told you Daniel's name is going to change as he's taken into a foreign uh, land, as he's taken away from the land that he grew up in, the land of his God, the land of his family. Daniel was given the name uh, Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, and uh, Mishael, uh, Meshash, and to Azariah, uh, Abednego. So I said Meshash, Meshach. So we have Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to, to defile himself in this way. So here we read that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been taken uh, from their homeland, and they've been taken into the land of the godless king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Now their worlds at this point are flipped upside down. Everything that they knew is different now. If they're going to have a future, it's going to be by uh, compromise, compromising with what they see in the new land and with the new leadership. Um, at least that would be what you would see in the natural. And so they're in a new home that doesn't regard God. And now they even have new names. And we see that this uh, uh, Bel Belteshazzar, or Belteshazzar, uh, it's hard to say, um, that it actually means Bel will protect. In other words, a... God, little g, is supposed to be now the protector of Daniel. And remember Daniel's name and what it really means, that God is his judge. And so in verse 4, uh, we see 
uh, what we read here, and let me get to the fourth verse. The Bible says, young men without physical defect, etc. They are young men. Daniel is believed to be somewhere around the age of 12, uh, maybe as high as 16. So you can see that he is either a preteen or he is a teen. Psychologists say that our basic personality is set by what age? Age eight. That our basic personality is set by age eight. In other words, that by that age, we have our likes and we have our dislikes. We have our work ethic. We have our worldview by the age of eight. You can think of your own life and where you were at at the age of eight and what may have created what is your worldview, even as early as when you turned the age of eight. And this is why the Bible says in uh, Proverbs 22, verse six, Train up a child in the way in which he or she should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. And certainly the Israelites knew what it was to train their children from a very early age in the ways of God. In verse five, in the second part of that verse, uh, we see that as they're in this new land now, they are to be trained for three years trained in the literature, trained in the history, trained in the belief system of, not God, the Babylonians. And so they are to have then the thoughts and the ways of the Babylonians, not of the Israelites. And it is an indoctrination. It is a brainwashing that they are seeking to do. It's interesting. The story is there of a giant uh, a giant old redwood tree that was 400 years of age. And when it fell, uh, people didn't know why it fell. It had survived, think about it, 400 years of storms, earthquakes, and everything that you can imagine, lightning, storms, survived it 400 years. But when it fell, they looked at the tree to figure out what made it go down. There was nothing that they could see that would make it go down, except when they went on to into the inside of the tree. And they found what were tiny little beetles that had eaten away the tree from the inside out. It looked fine on the outside. It looked strong on the outside. But the enemy came on the inside and was able to eat it away from the inside out. Now, Daniel is here in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. He's in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, the godless king. And he is offered the king's food. Well, this means that it's been consecrated to idols. That's the way they would have done it in those days in the godless Babylonia. And Daniel knew that it would be a compromise on his part were he to eat the food that had been given to him that had been consecrated to other gods. No Hebrew was to ever eat of such food. And Daniel knew this. Now, Daniel could have had any type of excuse. He could have uh, reasoned it away. And I want to say this because I have noticed it in our generation over and over again. It is so easy to excuse things. It is so easy to make an excuse and say, well, yes, but, and then go a direction that is other than the standards that God has set for us, which are standards of excellence and standards of anointing. So Daniel could have said that he was hungry. That's his excuse. He was starving. He could have said, no one of his race or of his faith would see it. He was in the courts to where he could eat this and only the Babylonians would know uh, and maybe not even them. So certainly those who would know his faith and be from his homeland wouldn't know. He could have said that he didn't. He could have said that his future seemed to be taking off in Babylonia. And if he's going to really be a success, hey, there are new rules now. There's a new way of doing this now. I used to do it the God way, but now I'm going to do it the way that I think I can go up the ladder the quickest. Didn't do it. 
he could avoid punishment uh, and accept, uh, be accepted by what was now uh, the in crowd. He could just do it again in, in, in private, avoid the punishment of not doing it as the, if any Babylonian official were to see it, and then think, well, I'm now in the in crowd. I've seen a lot of people go towards uh, the ways of this world because you've got an in crowd in Hollywood or an in crowd somewhere else that, that want to make it the cool thing to do it your own way to do it a way that isn't, has nothing to do with godliness or holiness. But Daniel doesn't care about the quote-unquote in crowd. In fact, he knows what the real in crowd is. He wants to please the audience of one. He wants to be in with the master himself, God himself. I was reading something I think that you will find uh, interesting because the question could be there, you know, what's a little bit of compromise? If I do most things right, everybody is flawed, everybody sins. So what's the big deal if I do most of it right? Oh, the far majority of it right. If I believe that God exists, if I believe that uh, the Bible is true, but I just compromise a little here and there. It's a little bit. Everybody's doing it. What is the impact of a little bit of compromise? Well, I was reading this. I want you to hear it. This is what you would get if 99% were to be good enough. In other words, just compromise that 1%. You would get no phone service for 15 minutes each day. 1.7 million pieces of first-class mail would be lost each day. Just 1%. 35,000 newborn babies would be dropped by doctors and nurses each year. 200,000 people uh, would be getting the wrong drug prescriptions, uh, prescriptions each year. Unsafe drinking water would be uh, the norm for three days of the year. There would be three misspelled words on the average page uh, that you would type. Two million people would die from food poisoning each year. That's just 1%. Just a little bit of compromise. But you can see what a little bit of compromise can do. In verse 8, the Bible says that Daniel resolved not to defile himself. In other words, none of these excuses that could have been there for him moved him in any way. He was intentional, proactive, determined, resolved that he would not defile himself before God. The enemy uses two tools that he'll try to tear you down with. One is persecution. And we know that there's persecution of the church all around the globe. You may know that there's persecution amidst your friendship group. There's persecution perhaps in your own family. You've been persecuted for your faith. You know that if you were to talk about God in a certain way, at your workplace, you would be persecuted. The other tool that is used by the enemy is compromise. Not compromise in the way of give a little here, give a little there, and we each get the best. But compromise as in letting go of your values, letting go of what matters the most, letting go of what the Word of God says in order to be liked or in order to fit in or in order to be promoted. Now, the enemy would like nothing more than for us to compromise our witness. Because the moment you do so, somebody says, well, that's what he or she says, but I happen to know, and then they go into the whisper mode. And we don't want to be able to give any ammunition to the enemy to speak against what we would say as we promote the gospel and the word of God. So in verse 8, we see that Daniel was, the Bible says, resolved. In other words, he was predetermined. Before he ever got to where the temptation would be there, he already knew where he stood. I challenge you to take a stand. I challenge you to be uncompromised in a compromised world. To know already where you would go before you ever get there. And that's why when Lisa and I were first starting to date, 
I prayed a prayer over a meal that we were having, and I prayed that God would allow me to honor her by acting in proper conduct in a way that would please God with her. I wanted to predetermine to the best of my ability to carry this through in a way that was honorable before him. Now, I can say this. We have the Spirit of God to carry us through to a place where we don't even think we can go. That's why when the Bible says, be perfect as I am perfect, meaning that the Lord says that to us, we might say, well, I don't know how to be perfect. I'm imperfect. I'm just flesh and blood. Jesus is God. How can I be perfect? But there is a standard there that shows that the Bible doesn't say be 99%. As good as you can be. The Bible says be perfect as I am perfect because the Bible gives us the spirit of God to be able to walk in God's ways so that we have the trajectory toward uh, godliness. And God then gives us the strength when we feel tempted. God gives us the strength when we feel like uh, we don't have what we need and we desire to have it. Other people have it. We want it. Uh, God gives us the ability to stand strong in such moments. So Daniel was resolved. He was predetermined to do this thing right before God. And that's what allowed him not to be swayed by the emotion of the moment, the desires of the moment, the hunger that he may have felt in that moment. In 2 Chronicles, in the 12th chapter, the 14th verse, it is said of the Israel-like king, the Israel's king, King Rehoboam, that he did evil, and I want you to hear this, he did evil because he had not set his heart, the Bible says, on seeking the Lord. So the king did evil because he wasn't predetermined. He hadn't set the sail of his boat yet, of his ship. Instead, what he did was he just flowed with whatever came. So he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. It's so important that we set our heart, the setting of the heart. So let's look at Daniel now once more. We'll go in the third chapter now, the fourth and the sixth verses. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, a zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now, I know we have issues that we may face in our day, and I know that we may have those things that we feel are our difficulties. But imagine if you got this mandate. Go back a few thousand years and put yourself in the sandals of those who just heard what I just read. And then let's look now in the 12th uh, verse and going down into the 18th. The Bible says, but there are some Jews whom you have set over the altars of the uh, province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. These are troublemakers, aren't they? Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. So Nebuchadnezzar clearly believes that he is greater than any deity uh, that he knows of. In other words, any small g God that isn't real. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. This is one of the most powerful verses in all scripture. Listen to this. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Listen to them as they take their stand. 
Listen to them as they're uncompromised in a compromised world. Be inspired by it. Be shaken by it. Be provoked by it. Listen, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, you may say, well, what is meant by, but if he does not? Is that a lack of faith? No. It's a belief that God is sovereign, that God has ways that are mysterious to us, but we believe that he's fully able. We're putting ourselves in a positioning to be able to be blessed by God. And so we can go into that furnace. We believe he'll deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're all right with whatever he chooses to do is what they're saying. But they're believing for deliverance. Exodus 20 verses 4 through 5 tell us that those in the faith are not to, uh, uh, let me say it again. Those in the faith are to bow to God and to God alone. In other words, they're not to bow to anybody but God. I got to know a uh, Christian contemporary recording artist by the name of Rich Mullins. This is back during my uh, university days when I was a student. And he had a song called, Where Are You? And in that song, these were the words that he sang. He said, you'll meet the Lord. You'll meet the Lord in the furnace. A long time before you meet him in the sky. Issues of faith are issues of everyday life. We don't need a Nebuchadnezzar and a fiery furnace to live out issues of faith. You're living them out right now in quarantine. You're living them out right now in regard to your job situation, your career situation. You're living them out right now in regard to your family, in regard to decisions that you need to make that are financial decisions, there are decisions about where you'll be over the next few years. There are decisions about how you're going to handle something that's come against you, whether to do it in your own strength, in your own abilities, or to look to God for supernatural power and for God's deliverance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have said, we will bow, but we won't mean it. They could have compromised. They could have said, we will bow, but we'll ask forgiveness later. We'll make it right with God after we compromise. Then we'll be okay. They could have said, we will bow, but we'll worship God too. We'll have a little bit of both. We'll just sip of this and sip of this over here too. And then we'll excuse it all and make it all right. Perhaps the Apostle Paul said it best when he said in Colossians 2.20, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belonged to it, do you, do you submit to its rules? We are not to submit to the rules of this world. We are to be a remnant people. We are to take a stand. We are to be of no compromise. We no longer represent the interests and passions of anything but our God. We no longer emulate the world. We now reflect the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Daniel 3, now let's read this last part that I'll read to you from Daniel today. Starting the 19th verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his armies to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other uh, clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The, king com the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were killed, just being at a distance, but throwing them in. And these three men, firmly tied, 
fell into the bla blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up? Weren't there three men? And that we threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. That was the terminology he had. He didn't know God, but he knew that this looks like deity. This looks like God. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, and prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. And they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to him say, praise be to the God, the true God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Now he sees this. He's seeing their testimony. It's lived out before him. They're uncompromised. And it's doing something on the inside of this king. Therefore, I will decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. No other God can save in this way. This was a king who believed that there were many gods, little g. Now he says none of these others can do what the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can do. The culture didn't change Daniel. The culture didn't change Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't give in. They didn't give up. They were salt and they were light. They took a stand. They remained uncompromised. Is Daniel's truth still truth today? Is God... The God of Daniel, still the God of today, does he still ru rule? Is he still powerful? Is he still able in regard to our nation? In the midst of an election time, is God still able? Is God still powerful? Is he still our supreme leader? Absolute, he is our leader. The ultimate leader is God himself. More than anyone who would try to take his titles, God is number one. Can God still deliver? Can God still heal? Can God still save? Daniel believed it. Do you? And do I? If so, we'll pray different. If so, we'll live different. If so, we'll stand in faith in an hour in which many have lost faith and we'll believe that God is in control. He's in charge. He's on the move. And he's rally crying the victory and we need only follow him and follow him with all diligence. It's time to decide who's worthy of your allegiance, God or the world. And if it is God, then 100%. If it is God, no longer this thing. How long are you going to hold on to two different things? No longer are you wobbling between the two, going back and forth. Instead, you go fully and completely towards God. It's time to make a decision. It's time to set your allegiance and to do so in a way that you are absolute, that you are predetermined, that you are fully and completely towards God and recognizing the world is not God. The world will never be able to do for you what God can do for you. Bow your head, if you will. I want to pray with you. It's a setting of the heart, God. And I pray that everybody hearing my voice right now will determine I'm setting my heart towards you. You have my full allegiance. You are the God of Daniel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Joseph, of Esther, the God of Paul and of Peter. We could go on and on, Priscilla. God, we know that there are ones that have 
lived out the faith, men and women who went after you with all that they were. They let go of their hold on the world and gave you their full allegiance. Father, we give our nation to you now. God, carry our nation where only you can carry us. We repent as a people. We come before you, God, that we declare your priorities. We declare your ways. We declare, God, that your principles will go forth. God, righteousness exalts a nation. We pray for righteousness in our nation. Father, for each one listening to me right now, I pray that, God, they will make a decision to receive your Son as Savior and Lord, to live for you, God, to fully and completely dedicate their lives to you, even if it's a rededication right now, how beautiful that is in your eyes. And so, as they pray this prayer with me, God, I know all of heaven will rejoice. And I pray, God, that you will do what you do supernaturally to seal this by your spirit in their hearts. Pray this prayer with me, dear Jesus. I repent of my sin. I am a sinner. You are holy. I believe you died on the cross for me. You rose from the dead on the third day, even as the Bible says. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are my Savior and Lord. And I give my life to you. And for some of you, you're praying, I give my life to you afresh and anew, reprioritized, rededicated. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus, and we believe, God, your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you, and God bless you, each and every one.